I want to do an example of interacting systems in statistical mechanics. And this is going to be an example we're going to build on some what I hope is existing knowledge for anyone watching this. If it's not, we're kind of starting in the middle of the story, so uh, it might not be for you. Here's the story. We're going to be looking at interactions between two Einstein solids. Uh, now, as you may recall, an Einstein solid is a model of solid systems where you basically say, okay, every atom in a solid is, uh, is in a specific place in the crystal lattice, and so it will have some natural oscillator mode, sort of springs holding in place, molecular springs holding in place, and you can break this up into an X, a Y, and a Z oscillation of that atom in the solid. And so each atom in the solid will contribute three simple harmonic oscillators to the behavior of the solid. It's a halfway decent first approximation how solids work. That's the idea of an Einstein solid, and we're going to study it based on the motion of energy between these two, between two interacting Einstein solids. Energy in harmonic oscillators, as you know from quantum mechanics, comes in equal size steps. The harmonic oscillator in quantum mechanics has a ground state, and then above that ground state, you can add one, two, three, n units of energy, and each one of those energy steps is the same size. That's the beauty of this system as a simple model in statistical mechanics, is that we can use that equal size energy to just say, how many energy units do we have? So in this system, Na is the number of harmonic oscillators, simple harmonic oscillators in solid A. It's a th three times the number of atoms. And QA is the number of energy units, in units of the size of the harmonic oscillator HF, Planck's constant times the natural frequency of that, that are in that solid. So QA energy units. This, this solid is going to be interacting with a second one with NB oscillators and QB units of energy. And, uh, and so we're going to give some labels to all this. Q, little q, without a, late, without a subscript, is going to be the sum, QA plus QB. That's the total number of energy units in our combined system. We're also, for this purposes of this example, going to take the special case where NA and NB are equally sized. They have equal numbers of, of oscillators, so both are equal to just plain N without a subscript. So that's our story. Uh, the idea is that the microstates of the system are based on exactly which oscillator in which solid has how much energy. And the macrostates are going to be labeled by QA. How much of the total energy Q is in solid A right now? So of course, we might start with lots of energy in solid B and very little in solid A. And then we let them begin to interact. And we can ask the question, what is the eventual state of this system? What, what can we say is the most likely eventual state that the system will come to? Uh, hopefully, our intuition tells us, because they're equally sized, hopefully that we should know that the two will equilibrate and they'll have equal QA and QB at least pretty close uh, as our most likely state. But we want to understand that. We want to understand why that's the case and, and get to that point. Uh, the other thing we're going to do in this example, just to simplify things, is we're going to look specifically at the low temperature limit of the Einstein solid. Now, low temperature limit, low temperature means low average energy per oscillator. And that means, in particular, in the limit, we're going to take Q, the total number of energy units, to be much less than N, the size of either the number of oscillators in either one of these things. What that means, if Q is 1,000 times less than N, then on average, we could say that 999 out of 1,000 oscillators in either one of these, we would say, will not have any energy at all. It'll be in its ground state. Well, it'll have its ground state energy, but no additional energy above that. Uh, the other, and the, you know, there will be one out of a thousand will have energy if, we're, if Q is a thousand times less than N. Uh, I, occasionally, maybe uh, there will be unlikely cases where one oscillator will have two or three or five units of energy, but it's going to be very unlikely in that situation. They're going to have much energy piling up on top of itself. They're going to have one oscillator with a hundred units of energy. That's unlikely in this very dilute, very low temperature limit. Okay, so that's, our, that's the story that we're starting from. And in statistical mechanics, our goal is always to think about counting of states, to think about how do I count the states for this. I, I, should, I should be clear, I'm talking right now about the microcanonical ensemble, uh, so to speak. Uh, it's counting individual states rather than equilibrium with some outside system. We're taking a specific total energy, so we have a known total energy, and we're working with that. And uh, to be even more specific, I'm working right now with the notation and approach taken in Schroeder's thermal physics textbook, which I quite like and I recommend if you don't have it already. So okay, here's our story. We have previously derived, 
uh, either in a homework problem or in class or something, we have previously derived that the number of microstates in an Einstein solid A in the low temperature limit is approximately equal to E, that's 2.718281828459045, whatever, uh, E times Na, that's the number of o oscillators in solid A, divided by QA, the amount of energy in solid A, that's our macrostate label, all raised to the QA power. And similarly for solid B, same thing, this is the low temperature limit of the multiplicity, the number of microstates for solid B. Uh, I should make one more comment. These limits are taken under the assumption that all these variables, n, qa, qb, that these are large numbers. And by large numbers, I mean on the order of Avogadro's number. Large enough that if I add 173 to it, I won't even notice. For that matter, if I add 10 billion to it, I won't even notice. These are orders on the order of 10 to the 20th or 10 to the 23rd or something. They're very big compared to our everyday experience. Uh, that means that something, a large number, or even a normal number, raised to a large number power is ridiculously huge. It's a very large number, and those are wacky big. We'll deal with that as it comes along. But for right now, our goal is to understand, I guess, this is a graph of omega total, the total multiplicity of this system, the total number of microstates, as a function of QA, as a function of the macrostate label, how much of the energy is in solid A right now. Uh, and what I'm graphing the total, of course, is omega A times omega B, since these are independent solids. If I know QA and QB, I can just find those omegas, find those multiplicities, and they're independent. I multiply them together, they're going to make a total. Our intuition tells us that there will be a peak around Q over 2, around QA equals Q over 2, half of the energy being in solid A and half in solid B. We expect that to be the case. Uh, we could prove it mathematically, take some derivatives or something. That sounds like a pain. I'm not going to do it. But uh, we could prove that that's the peak. Uh, it, but what I really want to understand is what's the width of that peak? This is a more sophisticated question. What is the width of the peak of this multiplicity function? And by width, uh, I guess uh, probably what I mean is if I go 1 over e down, uh, what is the distance between the two sides if you go to the 1 over e of the maximum value? That's, that's what we're aiming for here. So, okay, this is our setup. This is what we're going to do. And we're, we're, like I said, we're starting in the middle of a problem. You could work out these multiplicities individually. We're going to go from here. So, okay, uh, I want to start by taking this omega total expression and writing it down in terms of our actual variables, our, our macro state variables and all that sort of thing. Uh, I know that Na and Nb are both equal to N. So if I write this down, let me see where I can put this. I'm going to write down omega total equals omega A times omega B. That tells me this is going to be E N over Q A to the Q A power times E N over Q B to the Q to the Q B power. That's my uh, that's my product and. I can factor out these like terms, the En. Uh, this is equal to En to the power QA plus QB. That's a B, really it is. Times, and then my denominators. I've got QA to the minus QA power times QB to the minus QB power. And the one other thing I can do to simplify my life is this, this is the QA plus QB. The nice thing about that is it's independent of our macro state QA because that's just our total energy Q and that was given. So I can write this as EN to the Q times QA to the minus QA times QB to the minus QB. Okay, this is something that I can now work with. I want to understand the graph of this function is a function of QA. Now, remember, QB is just Q minus QA, so we're going to be able to do some things with that. But actually, what I'd like to do, I'd like to express this in terms of a new variable, the distance away from the center line here. So if this is my Q over 2 coming up, instead of labeling by QA, if I want to describe the peak of this function, what I really want to do is just call this variable x. So uh, in particular, uh, what I want to do, I want to define QA to be equal to Q over 2 plus X. 
that's my story. So similarly, QB has to equal Q over 2 minus X so that when I do QA plus 2 QB, I get just the total, total Q, the total amount of energy in the system. So uh, that's, that's my story. I've got this, uh, that I'm defining X this way. And uh, by, by using the definition, I'm going to be able to do some interesting things in my exponent over there. So, okay, uh, what I want to do now, uh, this, this form, I'm going to also assume that X inside this peak, I, I, I want to understand the peak. I'm expecting the peak to be small. Uh, I haven't proven it yet. I'm going to guess that and we'll verify as we go along that it is small. So I'm going to assume that X is much less than Q. Uh, assume, then check, X is much less than Q. And if I do that, what I can do, I can write these things as a Q over 2. Uh, I'll bring this up. Uh, this is going to be Q over 2 times 1 plus, let's see, I need this to be 2x over Q. And this would be Q over 2 times 1 minus 2x over Q. Uh, that is writing this explicitly, QA and QB each explicitly, in terms of something, uh, a constant, a term up front, which is for us constant, Q is a constant, times 1 plus something small. This is writing it explicitly in terms of something we can do expansions with. We can, we can use some identities and things to simplify. So writing it this way, writing it in terms of, I, this isn't an approximation yet, but doing it this way, writing it this, in this form is going to let us use this in, a, in an effective way to study the small width of this peak. Okay, so that's where we're going. Let me see what I want to do. I, I want to look again at What's going to happen when I write, when I look at QA to the minus QA power? What's that going to look like here? And uh, when I do it, I'm going to keep the exponent, uh, well, I'll, I'll see where it takes us. I, I, I want to write this as, uh, I want to write QA to the minus QA power. My goal, my goal in this is to try to, as much as I can, extract things that are going to be, that I can write in terms of Q instead of QA, the total, the constant total uh, energy instead of the macro state label QA. I want to extract those as best I can, and then I want to write this in terms of small things, you know, things to a power so I can use some approximations, work it out that way. So QA to the minus QA power. Uh, if I do this, this is, well, QA, I've got it here. It is Q over 2 to the minus QA power times 1 plus 2x over Q to the minus QA power. I've got that going on. Um, so, uh, so that's useful. I can say the same thing about QB. Oh, do I want to say one more thing about this before I go on? Um, I'll keep it here for now. So, so I guess uh, th this QA, this Q over 2 to minus QA, uh, I'll, say it, I'll say it now. I can do the same thing that QB to minus QB power is going to be Q over 2 to the minus QB times 1 minus 2x over Q to the minus QB power. Uh, the reason I'm doing that is I'm multiplying these two together, right? QA to the minus QA times QB to the minus QB. That means these first two terms are going to multiply together. And when I write this down, when I put that together then, I'm, when, I, when I put these in here, I'm going to find that this gives me, uh, this equals, I've got E n to the Q, and then from these two terms, I'll, I'll go ahead and write it down, Q over 2 to the minus Q A times Q over 2 to the minus Q B times, uh, and then my other bit here is these two terms here, uh, I've got my 1 plus 2x over Q uh, to the minus Q A times 1 minus 2x over q to the minus qb power. Doing all that, the reason I've done this is that these two things, again, this is q over 2 to the minus qa minus qb, that, is a to the, that combines to the minus q power, because qa plus qb is q. So I put that together, I can then say this equals, I can put that in with this, and it's negative, this is going to be 
2 e n over q to the q. That's what I've got combining that in times, and then these terms, 1 plus 2x over q to the minus qa times 1 minus 2x over q to the minus qb. Now, I can't combine these in the way you might want to because they have different exponents and different bases. So I've got to find something to do with these terms. I've got to figure out what I need to do with this. Again, my goal in this, the reason I'm doing it, is that this is the function that I'm graphing down here, and I want to understand the peak. I want to understand this as a function of x. There are x's hiding in qa and qb. We're going to deal with that in a second. So that's where we are. We're, we've got this We've got this put together. We've got the beginnings of this. So I want to understand these terms. I want to understand what those are going to look like. And I'm going to have to use some nice identities to do that. Um, and maybe, how do I want to represent an identity for you? Uh, maybe what I should do, uh, this will be good. Maybe what I should do is write down this fact uh, about, uh, it's, it's a binomial approximation sort of, uh, but not quite. It's a little more sophisticated. Uh, just so we have it to work with. Uh, let me put this fact here. Uh, if you have a 1 plus epsilon to the n power, oh, I don't want to say n because we're using that in this thing. I'll call it 1 plus epsilon to the a power. Uh, if you have that, there's this usual thing where you can say, oh, that's about a times 1, one plus a epsilon is, the, is what that's approximately equal to. We want to do one step better than that. We want to do some, uh, some, some approximations to keep track of what happens when a is very large as well, because that can be a big deal. 1 plus epsilon to the a is equal to, I guess just exactly equal to, e to the a times the natural log of 1 plus epsilon. That's just an, equal, that's just an equality. Nothing fancy there. And we know that if epsilon is much less than 1, the natural log of 1 plus epsilon is there's an expansion for this, right? It's epsilon minus one half epsilon squared plus one third epsilon cubed plus some other things. But I'll just keep a couple of terms in this expansion for right now. So this is this is a true fact. So in that same condition, one plus epsilon to the a power must be approximately e to the a times epsilon minus one half epsilon squared plus dot dot dot. I've got that uh, going on. Or I guess if I want to write, if I want to pull out my leading term, I, I could write this as e to the a epsilon 1 minus 1 half epsilon plus da da da. OK, so I've got this whole thing. This is my first thing. Now, if additionally, if also uh, a times epsilon is much less than 1, now that we've got that limit, then we can do a Taylor expansion of e to the x well, e to the a epsilon. If additionally that's true, we get that this is 1 plus epsilon to the a, then is approximately 1 plus a epsilon plus dot, dot, dot. But we're going to focus on that earlier thing. We're going to focus on this example, this layer here, where we can, uh, where we can write down exactly what that term is going to do. At least I think that's where I stop to do this. Yeah, that sounds good. So, OK. We're going to use that mathematical fact applied to this thing. And this is important because QA is a large number. It's very big. I, and whereas this is small, we're more in this range than in that we don't have, we don't know for sure that A times epsilon, if A times this, uh, the exponent times the smallest quantity is much less than one. So I want to apply that. I, I want to apply this result to this expression. And I want to say that 1 plus 2x over Q to the minus QA must be approximately equal to e to the, now my A is minus QA, minus QA times 2x over Q is my small quantity, times 1 minus 1 half times 2x over Q, uh, and plus dot, dot, dot. OK, got that. Get my finger all dirty here. All right, so uh, that's my. Uh, and that's what I've got for this for this term. I get this thing. I, I get a nice nice expression going. That's good. Um, I can do the same thing for my other term for for the for the second one. Uh, I can I can get this down and say that this is going to be uh, that one minus two x 
over Q raised to the minus QB power is going to be approximately E to the minus QB 2X over, oh wait, but remember this is going to be plus, I, I better be explicit, minus QB times my epsilon here is negative 2X over Q times 1 minus 1 half and my epsilon is negative 2X over Q plus dot dot dot. Okay, I've got those two terms. And remember, in my omega total, I'm multiplying the two together. So now let's see what happens when we combine these terms, when we put them together. Um, and uh, let's see, is that where we want to do this? I think, I think I may actually wind up needing to also plug in for QA and QB up here. Um, yeah, okay, so, so because I've got QA and QB still in here, I'm going to have to put in those in terms of their definitions as well. So why don't I do that next? I'm going to keep this part here so we can interpret what we're doing. I'm going to erase this omega total at the moment. We'll come back to it. We're going to keep building on it. And I'm going to keep these next rows here just long enough to use those definitions again inside those exponents. The exponents are getting to be pretty much of a bear at this point, right? But so putting it together, I've got 1 plus 2x over q to the minus qa is approximately equal to e to the thing. So do I want to write that as exponential? Well, mm -hmm. well let's see what happens. We're going to write it as e to the, now, minus qa. I'm going to put in this form for qa here. Oh, I cut the top off my q. Uh, minus q over 2, 1 plus 2x over q. That was my minus qa times 2x over q times 1 minus 1 half 2x over q. That's a lot of mess going on there. There's a lot of a lot of messy stuff happening, but but we can get through it. We'll we'll see where this takes us. Uh, let me let me say that that term then is equal to e to the minus. Okay, what can I do to simplify my life a little bit? Just looking at this right away, I've got a q canceling with a q and a two canceling with a two in that product. Uh, that's already making me feel better about what I have here. So this is e to the minus. Uh, there's an x outside of parentheses, and then when I multiply this out, I get a 1 plus 2x over q minus a half of 2x over q, so minus x over q, so 1 minus x over q, uh, right, no, plus, it was 1 plus 2x minus a half 2x, so 1 plus x over q, and then minus 2 times 2 over 2 is 2x squared over q squared. So minus 2x squared over q squared. All right, I've got that. <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, for my other one, when I do this same thing with the qb term down here, I'm going to change colors just so I can keep these a little more separate in my eyes. Um, I've got my 1 minus 2x over q to the minus QB, and we've got that approximately equal to, again, QB here, so I'm going to say there's a, well, let's see, minus and minus, that's going to give me an overall plus, right? So I'm going to say this is E to the plus, and plugging in for QB here, plus Q over 2, and then this term, 1 minus 2X over Q, got that. Um, got that, that's my QB times 2x over Q, didn't need parentheses there, oh well, times, I guess I should clear this out, huh? uh, times this term, 1, mm, and that's minus a half minus there, so plus, and a half times 2, 1 plus x over Q, and I'm leaving out the higher order terms. I'm, I'm doing the approximation here. Uh, so okay, again, I simplify things. Uh, my q over q, my two over two cancels out. It's very much a parallel calculation at this point. It's, it's very similar, but this line now equals e to the, I've got an x times, what do I have? Uh, one 
minus 2 plus 1 is, so 1 minus x over q, and then uh, 1 minus that, then minus, because that's 2 times 1, minus 2 x squared over q squared. Okay, so we've put this together. We've, we've got a lot of stuff going on. We've, we've, we've we expanded these out in terms of these exponentials, and now we're going to multiply them. We're just going to multiply these two terms together to get that term. Um, I guess uh, I may as well just do that part of it next rather than doing other things. So let me let me get that multiplied, just the two the two terms in parentheses multiplied together, and see where it takes me. So okay, um, I've got then one plus two x over q to the minus q a times 1 minus 2x over q to the minus qb power. That's approximately equal to, let's multiply these together, e to the, oh goodness, let's just, uh, I'll, 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 I'm going to expand this out, I think, uh, because we're going to have to add exponents a lot. Well, yeah, let's just do it. I've got e to the minus x plus x squared over q well, minus x, minus x squared over q, minus x, minus x squared over 2, x squared over q, plus 2x cubed over q squared, times e to the, expand this one out, plus x minus x squared over q, minus 2x squared, or x cubed, sorry, x cubed over q squared, and when I put these together, uh, when, I, when I multiply this out, you're going to find, you know, I could have sworn that that last term was going to be important for me somewhere. Why is that going away? Um, yeah, okay. I guess, uh, I guess I get the canceling out. So, you know, that may actually already have been too small to care about. Uh, when I multiply this out, I add the exponents, right? And so that's going to mean that this x and this minus x and plus x are going to cancel out. For that matter, this term and this term will cancel out. I think that probably those were already small enough I didn't need to worry about them. Well, let's see. Anyway, um, when I do this, then I get e to the, the x's turn cancel out, I get minus 2x squared over q. And that's what I'm left with uh, to order x squared up there. There's some x to the fourth term as well, but that's going to go away. So uh, that's going to be much smaller uh, than this one. So I've got this relationship, this, this minus 2x squared over q squared, and what that tells me, that's these last two terms over here. So I can come back and I can say then that my omega total is approximately equal to this 2en over q to the q times e to the minus 2x squared over q. And the beauty of this is that we've now got something that looks like a Gaussian function e to the minus x squared, or e to the minus constant times x squared, is a Gaussian function. That's the classic bell curve shape. And, uh, and what we have is an overall constant out front. If x equals 0, this is our maximum. So we've verified here this is a maximum point because the Gaussian will drop off on each side. And so we're at a maximum. This is, the, this is what we get if x equals 0, if qa equals qb equals total q over 2. Uh, and so that's the height of this thing. The, the height of this curve is 2en over q to the q. That's our height. And then the width. How do I find that width? Well, what is x when this goes down to, let's say, 1 over e of the total height, 1 over 2.7? Uh, maybe that's a better place to measure the width. What's that? What is x when it goes down to 1 over e? Well, if that uh, when omega equals 1 over e of omega max, that means, you probably can't even see this color. <laughs> when, when omega is 1 over e of omega, at, of omega max, that means, uh, what is it? This has to be e to the minus 1. So that means 2x squared over q equals 1. And I can solve. x equals uh, the square root of q over 2. Uh, that's that's already a nice thing. So x is the square root of two, q over two. So I guess the width, the full width, the full width is about 
2 times that, which would be the square root of 2q. There we go. Square root of 2q is our width. So the width is, that full width is approximately the square root of 2q. Now, this is going to be a pretty big number if q is a large number. Let's say q is 10 to the 20th. I'll uh, clear some space over here just to write this down. Uh, just to point this out, if Q is 10 to the 20th, so we have 10 to the 20th units of energy, if that's where we are, then the square root of 2Q is about 10 to the 10th, which is a big number. The this width is 10 to the 10th, except the width of the whole graph is 10 to the 20th. That means this is that means the width of the peak divided by the width of the graph is 10 to the 10th over 10 to the 20th, which is about 10 to the minus 10th uh, as a fraction of the total width. Uh, to put that in perspective, this is what? A quarter of a meter or something on my on my uh, on my thing here. This is maybe maybe it's 0.2 meters or something. Ten to the t minus tenth of that would mean that this peak is actually not a couple centimeters wide as I've drawn it. If this is the size of the graph, that peak would be two tenths of an angstrom across. Uh, that's getting pretty much uh, it, it's a fraction of the size of a of an atom across for for this peak. That's how narrow this peak is. And of course, if I went 10 times that to be two angstroms across, I'd have e to the minus 10th as my factor here. And e to the minus 10th would be an enormous dropping down. It's practically zero. I mean, it would still be a very large absolute number of, of multiplicity. But as a fraction of the total, it's minute. Two angstroms away, uh, you know, two angstroms, one angstrom on either side of this thing, of this central point uh, for this graph. And I would be down to e to the minus 10th of the of the height, that means that almost you know, the the overwhelming majority of the possible anchor states of the system, the overwhelming majority of the possible states the system could be in, are within an angstrom of q over two in this graph. What that tells us is that no matter how the heat was distributed to begin the heat, no matter how the thermal energy, the q, was distributed to begin with between these two, if you give the system time to equilibrate so that it has time to come to equilibrium exchanging to find that most likely to, to find to, to randomly move between microstates, you are overwhelmingly likely to wind up in your equilibrium state being in that atom thick peak in the middle of this graph. And that's how that's how and I'm overwhelmingly likely in the order of you know very large number likely. Uh, you know your your orders of magnitude more likely to be within an atom's width of the center of this peak than you are to be two atoms away, uh, much less any measurable distance away from the center. That's what, that, and that's what we say, that that's why thermal equilibrium happens. It's not that there's some deep principle in physics that says thermal equilibrium is better than other states. It's just that there are a lot more ways to be in a macro state that looks like equilibrium than to be in a macro state that's far away from equilibrium. And that's what, that's what saves us. So that's our story. That I know this is a bit of a, a mathy mess. But let me summarize what we came to here. Let me summarize what happened. The key ideas were that we started out with multiplicity functions for both solids, for both interacting systems. We multiplied them together. And then we took a stab at guessing where the peak was going to be. We defined x so that our qa was 1 plus 2x over q. So we were, um, I guess that was, yeah, we, we, we defined x so that our qa was shifted off from q over 2 by a little bit. And, uh, and that x being distance away from the peak, we then just threw a bunch of approximations at things. Uh, you can see we've proven now, by the way, that being inside that peak, x is much less than q. Uh, that's, a, that's a very small, not, that's a very, you know, 10 to the 10th less is the width of that peak. Even if we are a thousand times off that peak, it's still going to be much less than q. So we've proven that. Well, we, once we get that approximation, x is much less than q, we just have to keep throwing that approximation at this as best we can. And uh, then we get to some function where a lot of things cancel out. And we can hopefully, in most cases, it will come out looking like a Gaussian, an e to the minus x squared with some constants thrown in. Then the constants tell us the width. We can use those constants to figure out the width of that peak. That's our story. And the moral of the story 
is that thermal equilibrium will happen not because it's preferred in some mystical way, but just because it's mind-bogglingly more likely than not. That's where we end up with, and uh, I'll leave you there. <laughs>